Okay, this lesson should be fun. In this lesson, we're going to look at malware analysis. What is malware? Well, malware is um, any type of executable or any form of script or program that does nefarious things on your computer. And that could be a virus, a Trojan, spyware, anything of that nature. So your job as an IT administrator or security administrator, network administrator, or a forensics examiner, at some point in your career you're going to come up against malware. Now as you probably are aware there's a lot more malware for Windows as there is for uh, Linux and the Mac and uh, any other type of operating system. So how do you identify malware? How do you, once you identify the malware, or you identify, let's say, suspicious behavior on your computer, how do you deal with it? Um, it may be very simple as uh, installing software or running something like an antivirus to identify the malware, but um, a lot of times you're going to come up against, let me say not a lot of times, but on occasion you may come up upon a malware that is not well known, that doesn't have an antivirus or an anti-malware. Uh, or malware hash or signature that you can actually identify what the malware is. So that's when you'll need to put on your problem solving hat and try to find out what the malware is and what it does. And that's what this lesson is all about. And, uh, and so this, the, uh, the project will do will be fun. Uh, I will give you some malware and it won't be anything that you can just click on and it's going to do nefarious things but it, uh, the, the executables I give you um, do constitute malware and what we'll do is is that you will download these to one of your Linux VMs and you will analyze it so what we're going to go over in this lesson is all the steps and procedures that you will need to identify um, malware and how to find out what that malware does Oh, I love my job as a network administrator. It's Monday morning. Let me come in and I've read my emails and uh, now I want to see what's going on with the server. So uh, I'm going to do some things. Let me look and see uh, what's going on with the server. I want to see the open network connections. Okay, um, let me see. So I've got... Uh, NetBIOS here. Let's see, I've got a web server. That's good. I've got a FTP listening and DHCP and SSH and Telnet. Oh, i got to remember to close that. Wow, this is strange. Port 1234. I didn't open port 1234. Hmm. I wonder what that is. Okay, that's suspicious. I've, I've got to take a look at that because that port should not be open. All the other ports are well-known ports. 1234 is listening. That should not be. So our introduction to malware analysis. Uh, you should have read the first few chapters of, uh, of each of the freeware textbooks and it talked about malware analysis and how to identify uh, whether you've got malware on your computer So, here's the problem. Uh, how do you know that you've got malware? Move this around a little bit. That you've got malware on your system? Well, it could be for any number of reasons. Usually, and most typically, is um, someone will complain either about their system running funny, their system running slow, weird things happening on their computer, or it could be that you've run one of the antivirus programs or one of the anti-malware programs and it automatically finds it for you. Now the, in the former case you're going to have to do a lot more investigation. The latter case where you run the antivirus or the anti-malware software is going to be a little easier because it's going to identify um, the, the malware for you. And so the, the procedures we're going to talk about today is, as far as um, how to deal with m malware and how to 
find out what it does because a lot of times you know that's uh, it's something that you want to know it's not just the fact that you found something that's suspicious and you get rid of it you want to find out what it does because it may be something as simple as a skip uh, script kitty doing something downloading something on your server and running it or uh, someone clicking on a an email attachment and it runs something repetitiously in the background but also it could be something uh, much more nefarious uh, such as for example opening a back door so that somebody can have access to the files on a server that may contain critical information uh, that the loss of which could cause a uh, loss of competitive advantage for one of your uh, departments in your company. If you think of the intellectual property rights, for example, if somebody were able to get into Apple and steal their designs, can you imagine the the loss of uh, economic revenue if uh, somebody? And in fact, this is this has been done a lot by uh, by certain states. For example, the Chinese have stolen quite a bit of uh, intellectual property from companies in the United States. And that's always going to lead to a reduction in revenue for the company from which the files were stolen because a lot of the, uh, the design and development that goes into the, uh, the creation of a product, a lot of a corporation's money goes to the design and development of new products, especially if you think about those on the cutting edge. Yeah, and I give it, Apple as an example, but that goes for any hundreds or thousands of uh, companies out there. And it, it, it can actually ruin a company because somebody can take those designs and develop something cheaper because now they can put all their money into the production of the product as opposed to the design and development. So there's a lot of times that you'll come upon something where you want to delve deeper into it rather than just simply stopping what's going on. And in fact, there's some cases where you may not want to stop what's going on so you can not only... Um, identify what's occurring but also try to identify the perpetrators and so the the procedures that we're going to go over today are really general procedures however I'm going to be talking about this in Linux and that's because it's going to be a lot easier because the tools are um, available in Linux you don't have to download and install anything all the tools are there to uh, carry out these procedures in Windows it's a little different but the procedures will pretty much be the same as you'll see what we'll do is, is we'll take a uh, two major major uh, avenues to identify what's going on. We'll do something called a static analysis, and we'll do a dynamic analysis. And uh, one of the things you'll note today is that although what I'm pretending to do, is going through the procedures, is on a live server, in actuality what you would probably want to do, and I would say uh, most of the cases, is try to get the malware off your system and put it in a virtual machine and run it and the reason is is that way you can isolate it from your host machine and you can run all the procedures on it you can actually run the malware uh, making sure that the network connection um, is not connected to the uh, to the internet that is you can put your virtual machine on a host only based connection and therefore guarantee that, that the uh, Malware can't do anything that's detrimental to your production systems. Okay, so now let's take a look at the problem. So um, we talked about inodes in Linux and in the forensics classes, and as we know, is that the operating systems don't work with f file names when they're working with files. So the operating systems will actually uniquely identify a file by its inode number and let's quickly jump over here and take a look at what an inode is if we go back over here let's type man ls and let's search for inode whoops inode we'll see that the ls-i will print the index number of each file and each file will have a unique index number and you'll have the same thing on windows systems they're not called inodes but there'll be unique identifiers for each file on your system. So if we can go in here and type ls-i and let's sort this according to the inode number, you'll see in my home directory here is that we have four files and each one has a unique identify number and they've been sorted 
according to their inode number. And typically, uh, if you go into, for example, a larger directory, they're pretty much, the inode numbers are doled out by the file system according to uh, the, the time that they were copied there. So the first files that are copied will have lower numbers. The, the, the latter files you've copied will have higher numbers. So if we do an ls-i here on the bin directory, which contains binary executables, and we'll pipe that to less two, you will see that these have liar, uh, lower IDO numbers than what we saw previously because those are files that I created in the home directory while these were created when I install the system. And so essentially what we're looking for are uh, files with IDO numbers that are greatly out of sync. I mean, you see, you see most of these, these are pretty much in sync, 60, 62, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on, all the way down. There are some small gaps in here, for example, between cat and change group, but for the most part, those are pretty much in sync. Let's go back over here. So, so one of the ways you can identify a suspicious file is by looking at the IDNO number, and that doesn't necessarily guarantee that the file is suspicious, but it may be cause for concern. You can look at the MAC times. If they look suspicious, um, and that's roughly equivalent to looking at the IDNO number because uh, the, for example, if you update a file, it may not change the IDNO number, but if you create a new file, the MAC times in there will be dramatically different or may be dramatically different from those than the rest of the files uh, in your particular directory. And so n neither of these guarantees that you've got a, f a file just because it looks suspicious or because it has an updated MAC time doesn't necessarily mean it's a nefarious file. Furthermore, what if the file name looks okay, for example, cron D for the cron job, that's the cron daemon. If it's got a suspicious I node, and suspicious MAC time, but it's okay. Well, just because it has a name with which we are familiar doesn't necessarily mean the file is okay. It could be a Trojan horse. In fact, wouldn't it be a great way to hide a Trojan horse is name it the same name as something that already exists in the system and just call it something that that is a name with which we are familiar. In fact, a lot of the rootkits do just that. They'll take the ps command, the netstat command, and they will change the way it behaves such that, for example, they could have a sniffer running. However, the ps nor the netstat command would display the uh, the behavior or display anything that would that, that, that the sniffer was running. And so that's the idea behind a rootkit is to actually hide the fact that somebody's broken into your system and they're doing bad things on your system. So how do you determine whether the file is okay or whether it is a Trojan, whether it is a virus, whether it is a sniffer, or whether it is any other type of malware? Well, there's a couple ways we can do this simply called malware analysis. So there's, there's two basic procedures. We can do a static analysis. That is, we're not going to run the file. We're going to look at its properties and try to determine whether um, there's anything within the file or about the file that can tell us whether it's, um, it's a file that's doing something bad. We can also actually run the file, and that's called dynamic analysis. When you run a file, it changes the system's behavior. And so we can run the file, and we want to do this in a virtual machine. And we also want to make sure we do this with a host-based only network connection or with no network connection, because since we don't know what the malware does, we want to make sure that it doesn't have the capability to get out there on the network and actually do something that would cause damage to our own networks or systems. So let's take a look at static malware analysis. So essentially what we want to do is, is to determine the file characteristics, things about the file, without running it. Obviously if we've got malware on a Linux box, we want to run that in Linux. If we've got one on the Mac OS, we want to run it in that. If we've got a, if we think that the file 
it's running on Windows, we want to run that within a Windows VM. So as a security administrator, you can create your own test bed. You can have your computer set up with VMware. You can set up multiple types of operating systems, and you can copy over those files to the appropriate virtual machine and run them within that. So what do we want to find out? Well, we want to determine what type of file it is. We want to look at its contents. Well, wait a second. We're talking about binary files here, right? Well, sure. If it's if, if you're working with somebody who uh, who's created malware that's very sophisticated, in all likelihood, the file may be encrypted. However, there are uh, plenty of types of malware that are unencrypted. And what we'll see is, is that we can uh, look at the contents of the binary file, and a lot of it will be, of course, uh, unreadable, but occasionally the developer of the malware will leave comments within the system or, or even help files uh, that may give clues as to what the file does. We can also search for any clues that might suggest what the binary is, where it came from, when it was last modified, changed, and accessed. And if you think about it, there might be something else we can do to maybe identify what type or what the file is specifically. How would we do that? Think about that for a second. If we can identify the file, no, no matter what the name is, no matter what the modified change and access files are, to determine exactly what the file is. I'll let you think about that, but you should know that. And so what can we do within Linux? Well, we can do the same thing with Windows, only the tools are a little different. And what I wanted you to do for this class is to do something that didn't force you to download uh, other files for Windows. So all the tools that we need to do the static analysis we can do simply with the commands that are already in Linux. So what do we want to find out? Well, when was the file last modified, changed, and accessed? As we already saw in one of the earlier uh, classes, if you took one of the earlier forensics classes, uh, when you copy a file to another system, that necess doesn't necessarily change the modified, changed, and accessed times, or the MAC times, modified, accessed, and changed. So we can do that with the stat command. How do we determine what type of file it is? Well, we can't look at the name. We can't look at the extension under Linux. In fact, one of the simple ways to try to hide a command is just to simply change its name. For example, a lot of the early... Uh, malware in Windows uh, would have a VB script file dot VBS and they would change the extension to something like um, oh geez what were some of the earlier ones oh uh, the I love you love letter I love you dot text or dot doc and a dot VBS well that to the, the naive person that looks like a document file well the the dot VBS suggests that it's a Visual Basic script. And so that was a simple way to uh, execute social engineering against naive users. We can also look at the contents of the file. Again, these are binary files. How do we do that? Well, we can run the, f this, the command strings, which will strip out all the human readable strings out of the file. And this is just an example right here. I don't know, dash ATD. Uh, I, I think that's wrong right here. I should have changed that because that was that's the at daemon. Well, I'll, we'll go back and take a look at this. We'll look at the, at the man page and make sure that that's correct because I think what I did here was substitute in the, the file name for the command. But anyway, we can, we can strip out the strings, the human readable strings, and we can output that the file. We can search through it to see if there are any clues as to what the file is and what the file does. And once we strip out this information, we can take some of that, and what can we do? We can use it in Google and see if there's anything, for example, somebody might have posted the code somewhere, which would match the unique characteristics of the, the strings that we found in this binary file. And so what I'm doing here is giving you an overview of how all this works. 
Um, I will go into it and walk you through the steps shortly, probably in another video, because this was already about 20 minutes. This gives you a nice overview of what we're going to do. Next thing we're going to do is to do a dynamic malware analysis. That is, how do we find out what the binary does? How does it affect the system when the file is executed? That is, we want to run it. And obviously we want to run that from an isolated VM. For example, does, does it open ports? Does it create open sockets on our system? Does it change any of the files on the system? I mean, it's, there's, there's some files, there's some executables that will change the files in the system, but occasionally, and that's perfectly normal. However, sometimes malware may create a file, for example, that may be saving the information that's coming over the system, for example, the packets that are running over the network interface. Also, does it open any files? Well, as we'll see, there's a lot of executables that open files. But if we put all of these three together, we can try to identify whether the binary that we're working with is malware or whether it's just normal system behavior in a uh, normal file. So how do we do this? Well, does it create open sockets? Well, we can check that out with netstand-pan to identify if there are any open sockets. Did we see that previously? Well, let's take a look over here. Let's go back to the netstat command. You know, if I that, do a dash tpan, it's only going to show us the uh, TCP connections. But we could also look at the UDP connection, so let's go ahead and do that too. T-U-P-A-N. Less. Okay, so this is what we saw before. We know what 139 is. NetBIOS. Web server. FTP. DHCP. SSH. Uh, NetBIOS over SSL. And we have SSH again. If we look down here, we've also got some UDP connections. If we want to scroll down, but for right now, let's just take a look at the TCP. One, two, three, four. I don't know what that is. Well, if you don't know what it is, you should be suspicious of it because there's something listening on port one, two, three, four. That's not right. So you want to find out what that is. Okay, does it change any of the files on the system when executed? Well, we can look at the MAC times both before and after we run the file. So essentially what that means is, is we do, a, we can uh, look at the MAC times before the analysis, we can run it and then look at it afterward and then sort that and determine once I run that file, which will change what? The access time on that file if we've got this this list of MAC times that are sorted by date and time, we can look at the files that are open right after it. And even more simply, we can use the program LSOF, which means a list of open files, and determine what files the the binary opens, as well as the sockets. Okay, so I'm going to leave this lesson as, uh, as complete here, and in the next couple of demonstrations, next couple of lessons, I will do a static analysis, and then we'll do a dynamic analysis, and I will step you through the procedures, and we'll try to find out what that is. Port 1, 2, 3, 4. Please make sure that you've uh, done the assigned readings in both the textbooks. It's the first few chapters of each textbook. And uh, I've also uploaded a reference textbook called Malware Forensics that will walk you through uh, a lot of these uh, procedures for both uh, Linux and Windows. And our next lesson will be on a static analysis.